All right, I think we can uh, go and get started. So the plan for today is actually to start a new topic, which is motion planning. But before I do that, I just wanted to show you a couple of the videos that I couldn't show uh, in the, at the end of the, the last lecture uh, with LQR. So here's a, a video of a, a drone with an LQR controller implemented. And basically what's happening is that uh, the drone's kind of operator is giving the drone different set points, so different hovering states, uh, desired states. Uh, and the LQR feedback controller is basically stabilizing the system to these different states as they switch, uh, as you can see on the, the plot above. Uh, and this is a very well-tuned LQR controller. So you can see the performance is like super solid, right? It's like right, it's getting like right to the location, uh, hovering like completely solidly. Uh, so for our lab, we're not expecting you to get like this level of performance. So you, we could get to this level of performance, but it's just gonna take much more time. Um, so yeah, I guess we have kind of looser requirements for, for this lab, but uh, this is just to give you a sense for what we can achieve uh, with the LQR controller. Uh, here's a different system. This is uh, maybe a more fun example. This is actually work that I was uh, involved with uh, during my PhD. So this is a fixed wing airplane. So it's a kind of standard airplane with a propeller, single uh, propeller, well actually really two counter-rotating propellers at the top. Um, and it's doing what is known as prop hang, propeller hang. Uh, so it's kind of acting as a helicopter, uh, and it's using its wings, uh, its ailerons, its uh, rudder, and, and its elevator to stabilize itself to this prop hang uh, configuration. Uh, and I guess you might ask, like, why would you want to do this with an airplane? And the reason is, uh, it's kind of like a safety uh, maneuver. So if your drone is flying fast uh, and there's a wall in front of it, you could transition to this propeller hang and basically just like hang out there. So. Uh, this is also using a LQR uh, controller. Uh, here's a completely different example, so not drone related. Uh, this is a humanoid uh, robot that is using a LQR controller uh, to stabilize itself. So this is actually a hand-tuned, I think, uh, PD controller, proportional derivative controller. And then they had a, yeah, I guess it, it failed. And then they have a LQR uh, controller uh, that I think works slightly better on uh, on this example. Okay, so yeah, I guess these are just uh, the kinds of things one can do with uh, with LQR. Um, so it's a pretty powerful and, and really popular uh, technique for doing uh, feedback control, uh, and you'll see some of the power at least in this uh, lab uh, that you're currently doing. Uh, and I, I went over some of these uh, logistics for the lab, but just really quickly, so this is the, the space in the Anlinger uh, building. Uh, this is where we're gonna have office hours throughout the duration of this uh, assignment. Uh, so yeah, I guess maybe just make a note and don't show up to the equal, like show up here for, for office hours. Um, and this is the other space that we have in, in the equal. This is uh, G105. Uh, so for the lab, you're welcome to use uh, either one of these spaces. Uh, this one is slightly smaller, but the lighting is actually a, a bit better. Uh, we're not using cameras yet, but uh, later on in the course when we uh, work with cameras, the lighting here is just slightly better, uh, but it's a little bit more cramped, so there's a bit of a trade-off. Uh, and yeah, I went over these uh, logistics, uh, so everyone should have access at this point, so John Prevo uh, confirmed that, that everyone has uh, access to, to both spaces in Anlinger and in G105. Uh, just update your Tiger card, uh, hit a hotspot, and you should have access. Um, I want to emphasize this, I mentioned it in the PDF, but I want to, want to mention it here in, in lecture. Uh, so we take safety really seriously, so this is the reason we have you do the, the safety uh, training. Um, so the drones are obviously really small, and they're not going to cause you, uh, well, there's a limited amount of physical harm they can cause you, uh, but they can cause you physical harm, especially if they, like the propellers get close to your eyes. I think that's the, the biggest uh, thing uh, I guess we like worry about. Uh, so when you're operating in the drone cage, so like close to the drone, uh, please wear safety glasses at all times. So we've kept a, a bunch of safety glasses uh, in this space and also in the decode space. Um, so anyone who's uh, kind of operating in, inside or like standing, hanging out like inside the drone cage, you should wear safety glasses. Uh, for this lab, you really shouldn't need to get too close to the, the drone. You can uh, set the drone up, uh, come out, run the, the code, see it do something, probably fail in the beginning, 
uh, and then let go and switch it off. So when you're switching it off, that might be the only place, only uh, case you might want to get close to it. Question? Um, are the safety classes like, shared? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, so they are shared. Uh, yeah, I didn't think about that. That's a good question. Um, OK, we're going to try to see. Um, I guess you're worried about COVID, I imagine, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that's a great point. I didn't really didn't think about this. OK. Um, all right, we're going to try to maybe have uh, like some disinfectants or just try to have like enough safety glasses for everyone. Uh, I think we don't quite have enough for everyone, but uh, but yeah, that, that's yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. I'll, I'll try to respond. Yeah. Good. Other questions? Yes, at the back. Say that one more time. You could bring your own glasses. Yeah, but I guess I don't want everyone to like have to spend money to to do that. But but yes, if you do, if you have them, you're welcome to, to do it. Okay, got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Actually, do, does the school give them out uh, in general or or? Oh, okay. Okay. Maybe just a show of hands. I guess how many people have their own, maybe from a different class? Oh, it's actually quite a few. Okay. Okay. All right. So that might, we might have enough. Like if you bring your own and then combine that with the, the ones we have, uh, that might be enough. But yeah, I'll, I'll try to sort it out. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So that's it, I think, for the uh, LQR uh, components. I want to switch topics, uh, talk about uh, motion planning. Uh, and I guess just to, to motivate this, um, so if you, if you recall our uh, overall goal that I mentioned in the, the very first lecture uh, that we're trying to, to build towards, we're trying to get the drone to hover, uh, or sorry, to uh, navigate uh, autonomously uh, through uh, different optical environments, completely autonomously. And the, the first uh, module on feedback control uh, was just getting it to hover. Uh, so we're going to try to move beyond uh, hovering uh, in this module on uh, motion planning. Um, so yeah, the, the next five lectures, we're going to focus on basically a particular aspect of this problem of getting a, a drone to navigate autonomously through a cluttered environment. Uh, and that topic goes by the, the name of motion planning. Um, so here's a concrete uh, kind of problem. So it goes by the name of the, the piano uh, movers problem. Uh, so the setup is as follows. So imagine that you have some geometric model of a, a grand piano. Uh, so someone comes to you with a, a CAD model, for whatever reason, of a, a grand piano. Uh, and the question, uh, I guess, for you is how can we get the piano uh, from point A, uh, let's say that's the, the door of some small apartment, uh, to point B, which is where you want to, to place the, the piano at the end. Uh, how can you get it from point A to point B uh, without collisions, so without the piano uh, colliding with anything that's in the apartment? Uh, so maybe you have a, a CAD model of the, the apartment uh, as well. Um, so this is a fairly complex uh, geometric problem to, to get the, the piano from point A to point B, especially if the, the apartment is, is kind of uh, small and, and constrained. Uh, and just to make this very concrete, here's a, uh, a video um, of uh, like visualizing this piano movers problem. So someone has a, a CAD model or some sort of geometric model. And yeah, they're taking it through this sort of apartment-like uh, environment. So not super realistic, obviously. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, just to give you a sense that so I think that the main point here, really, that I want to emphasize is that the orientations can matter. right? So it's not you, you can't necessarily treat the piano as a sphere. So the, the geometry of the piano uh, actually matters because to get through tight spaces, you might need to like, change the orientation, like the roll pitch and yaw, uh, to get yeah get it to, to where you want without uh, colliding with, with anything. Uh, so this piano wars problem has a really long history in, in robotics, so at least uh, dating back to the, the 1980s, maybe even uh, I think before that. Uh, and there was a, a lot of work, uh, especially early on in the, the robotics literature, uh, trying to understand the, the computational complexity uh, of this problem. So suppose someone gives you a model of the, the piano, gives you a model of the apartment. Uh, can you find a, a path from configuration A to configuration B? That is some computational problem. Um, so it turns out that that problem is P space complete, so polynomial space uh, complete. 
uh, which uh, I guess maybe just a quick show of hands. Uh, how many people have heard the term PSpace complete? Okay, a few people. Okay, so yeah, roughly, yeah, it, 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 like the implication is that it's uh, computationally uh, not tractable. Uh, so we shouldn't uh, expect to find kind of exact uh, algorithms um, or at least exact efficient algorithms uh, to solve uh, the piano movers problem. Uh, and nowadays, the, the term uh, piano movers problem is essentially synonymous with motion planning. Uh, so if you hear someone saying, oh, I'm working on the piano movers problem, they don't literally mean they're trying to move a piano. Uh, they just mean that they're working on, uh, on motion planning. OK, so here's the, the, the motion planning problem then. Uh, so the goal is to uh, find a, a path, find some uh, uh, trajectory um, from some configuration A to configuration B uh, for your robot uh, without any uh, collisions with the, the environment. Um, and just, just again to, to emphasize this, we're assuming that uh, we have some geometric model of the environment that's provided to us. Uh, so how to actually get that geometric model, so how to get a, a map of the environment, uh, we're not going to worry about that right now. So we're just going to assume that someone has come to, come to you with a, a model of the, the robot, a model of the, uh, the environment, uh, and our goal then is just to solve this uh, motion planning uh, problem. Um, so here are some examples of, uh, of planning. Um, so I guess one of the maybe clearest ones uh, has to do with autonomous vehicles. Uh, this is a video from a, a startup company, Real Time Robotics, that's trying to speed up uh, motion planning. So as I mentioned, it's a complex geometric problem. Um, on an autonomous car, this needs to run pretty quickly. Um, so uh, this company is trying to basically speed up uh, these computations for motion planning. So I'll just play the video maybe just for a, a minute. Motion planning is a key component of autonomous car technology. Motion planning algorithms compute a path for an autonomous car to follow that avoids collisions with both static obstacles, such as potholes, and dynamic obstacles, like other cars, bicyclists, and pedestrians. Motion planning is critical but slow. Most implementations use one or multiple GPUs which consume hundreds of watts of power and are only capable of finding a single plan in about 100 milliseconds. This is fine for wide open highways, but it is not sufficient for much denser and less structured urban areas. All right. Um, yeah, I guess you, you can watch the, the whole video maybe. Uh, the rest of it is not super relevant for, for uh, this lecture anyway. Uh, here's a different one uh, that's not directly related to, to robots. Th these are kind of these mechanical uh, puzzles that uh, maybe you've uh, played around with. Um, so you can think of this as a motion planning problem. So there's some initial configuration of these puzzle pieces that's given to you. Uh, there's some final desired configuration where uh, these things are separated. So essentially any desired config any configuration where uh, these two pieces are separated, you could say, uh, achieves the, the goal of solving the, the puzzle. Uh, so you can think of this as a, as a motion planning problem, and uh, there's actually some planning algorithm that's running uh, under the hood uh, that generated this, uh, this plan uh, to get these puzzle pieces apart uh, in, in the video. Uh, here's another example. Maybe this is not, uh, this might be like slightly uh, less uh, obvious as a, to think of this as a planning problem, but, but it really is. Uh, so this is Rubik's Cube uh, solving. So let me play the video and then I'll, I'll uh, say a bit about it. Solving three, two, one. <laughs> yeah, so there's like whole teams of people working on uh, solving Rubik's Cubes really, really fast, autonomously. <laughs> Uh, and the reason this is a, a planning problem, right, is, is uh, there's some initial configuration that the Rubik's Cube has. Uh, so some like random like shuffle configuration. There's some final desired configuration where all the, uh, the faces have the, the same colors. Um, and our goal is to get this uh, Rubik's Cube from that initial configuration to uh, the desired uh, configuration. And you can think of that as a motion planning problem. So the motion here is literal, right, there's actually like the sort of robotic or mechanical system that's like turning um, the, the faces around uh, for the, the cube. Okay, so um, as with, with feedback controls, so when we talk about feedback control, um, if you remember, 
there were two uh, criteria, two things that we wanted. Oh, sorry, question. This is about the Rubik's Cube. Yes. But I'm just wondering, I, actually, I don't really know how Rubik's Cubes work, but I'm just wondering, is there like a certain like, number of moves that will always get you to the correct solution? Or does the robot actually have to have some sense of like, the colors on the cube and like check those and that's Oh yes, yeah, so definitely the, the latter. Um, so this is not what would be called an open loop plan, so it's not a set sequence of, of operations. So the robot uh, is actually looking at the, uh, the specific like initial configuration of the Rubik's Cube uh, and then choosing actions uh, accordingly uh, to get it to the, uh, the final goal configuration where all the faces are the same color. Uh, yeah, so it's not a set sequence. The, the sequence of actions uh, depends on the initial uh, configuration. Yeah, good question. OK, so yeah, when we were talking about feedback control, we said that we want a feedback controller uh, to do two things, or at least two things. So the, the first one uh, was just stabilize your system. So we talked about different notions of stability, local asymptotic stability, global asymptotic stability, and, and so on. Um, and then we had said, okay, stability by itself may not be enough. Like maybe we also want to optimize some objective, some performance criterion. Uh, so we want some notion of optimality as well. Um, and there's a kind of similar um, a set of criteria here uh, when we're thinking about motion planning. Uh, so at the very least, uh, we want a motion planning algorithm uh, to get your robot from configuration A to configuration B. Uh, without colliding with anything. Uh, so we call that feasibility. Just find me any path uh, that gets from A to B without collisions. Uh, but of course, that path could be really inefficient, right? So to get from here to here, I could do all sorts of like, weird things uh, and still like, get to my goal. Uh, so I, in some sense, I want to find uh, a path that is the, the best, uh, or maybe close to the best, according to some uh, performance criterion that I, uh, as a user or like a robot kind of designer, uh, want to be able to define. So uh, one example of a performance criterion might be distance. Uh, so get from uh, point A to point B uh, with the, uh, the shortest distance path. Uh, another one could be time. Uh, other ones could be energy and, and so on. So I guess you can come up with, with many different uh, reasonable uh, performance uh, criteria that you might want to optimize. Uh, so it turns out this by itself, just getting feasible plans, um, so just avoiding uh, collisions, uh, is, is pretty uh, challenging uh, by itself. Uh, that's the, the problem we're going to uh, start off thinking about uh, today. Um, and then optimality, I think, is nice to have, um, but is not always uh, kind of computationally uh, tractable to get, to get uh, optimal paths. Uh, and it's not always clear that you want like the optimal path. Like, really, uh, you want something that's like good enough, like it doesn't do something completely like ridiculous in terms of distance or time or, or energy. Uh, but yeah, we want some kind of uh, optimality as well. Okay, so just to make uh, make the assumptions really explicit, I think it's important to uh, to state these uh, clearly and make sure we understand uh, what we're assuming. As we go through the course, we're going to relax some of these assumptions, like get rid of some of these assumptions. Uh, but at least for now, uh, as I mentioned before, we're going to assume that the geometry of the robot and the geometry of the environment are provided to us in some format. Think of a, a CAD model, for instance. Um, the other assumption we're going to make is that any path that our motion planning algorithm comes up with uh, is actually executable by the robot. Um, so this is not necessarily true. Uh, so for instance, imagine you have an autonomous car, uh, and my motion planning algorithm says, uh, just move sideways. Right? So this is not something at least a normal car is able to do, like literally move sideways. Uh, for now, we're just going to assume kind of omnidirectional motion. We're just going to assume that the robot can execute any continuous uh, path that uh, comes out of a motion planning algorithm. Uh, we'll relax that assumption in, in just a couple of lectures. Uh, the third assumption uh, is that any path uh, that, that is uh, uh, given by a planning algorithm uh, can be perfectly followed by the robot. Uh, again, this is not uh, really true, uh, but this is some somewhere uh, some place where uh, feedback control uh, really helps, as uh, so you can correct for some deviations at least uh, from a target uh, uh, plan, target path uh, using feedback control. It's not going to be perfect, uh, and thinking about the imperfections again, we'll we we'll get to uh, in a couple of lectures. But uh, at least for for this lecture and uh, next lecture, we're going to make these three uh, assumptions. I guess any questions? Yes, go ahead.
Yeah. Yeah, good question. So for now, we're thinking about the, the second version of the, the question, um, or, or second version of the, the problem, where uh, we have some initial configuration, some final desired configuration, some obstacles, uh, and we're just going to do it, like do the motion planning all at once. Uh, the assumption there is that everything is static, so the obstacles are not moving around, uh, and that everything is known beforehand. Uh, so if those, uh, those assumptions are violated, uh, then it might make sense to replan. So you find some plan to the end, you execute it a little bit, uh, you see where things are moved around, you plan again, and so on. Uh, we won't think about that for now. Uh, I'll mention maybe a little bit uh, about how to do that uh, in, in uh, like closer to the end of the, the planning uh, module. But yeah, for now, it's just beginning to end all at once. Question? So I'm not sure if you mentioned this, but when you mean perfectly followed, yeah. what's big optimized there? Um, so what I mean is uh, basically in terms of like the distance to the desired path. So let's say this is my starting like configuration. This is my ending uh, configuration. Um, so if you have some imperfections in the model of your robot, your dynamics model of your robot, um, or some external disturbance like like wind, let's say, you might start off here like trying to follow this, but you might end up like kind of deviating a little bit. I've exaggerated the, the deviations here. Uh, maybe there's a wind gust that came and blew your drone away from your target trajectory. Uh, so we're basically, for now, going to ignore that, like ignore uh, the possibility that your drone might move away from the desired path. We're just going to say that somehow, magically, your drone is going to exactly follow uh, the path that the, the planning algorithm uh, gives out. Good. OK. So what we're going to focus on uh, in this lecture and, and uh, the, the next lecture is what's known as uh, discrete planning. Um, and the, the reason we use that term uh, is that we're going to discretize some continuous uh, environment. Um, so here's a kind of cartoon version of the, the planning problem. Uh, let's say you just have a point robot, uh, so a robot with no like, physical extent, um, that starts off at, at, at this point A uh, and wants to get to, to point B. Uh, these are the, the obstacles in, in blue. Um, what we're going to do with these like discretization methods is take this uh, continuous space, so R2, uh, and discretize it into some kind of grid-like um, uh, regions, uh, as uh, illustrated on the, on the slide. Uh, and then we're going to solve the, the planning problem uh, for this uh, discretized environment. Um, and yeah, I guess the, the reason we're, we're going to do this is that if, if we discretize our continuous environment, uh, then we can use some pretty powerful algorithms for graph search, uh, which we're going to discuss today, uh, to solve the, the planning problem uh, for the discretized version of the, the problem. Um, so there's, a, I guess, a number of different choices I've, I've made just even in drawing this one uh, picture. Uh, so I chose a uniform grid. So if you look at each cell in the grid, uh, they have exactly the, the same size. Uh, in principle, you could choose a non-uniform grid. Uh, maybe things that are far away from obstacles, uh, you could have like a large cell. Uh, things close to the obstacles, you could have a higher resolution, so like smaller cells. Uh, for simplicity, we're just going to say uh, we're going to choose a, a uniform grid, all cells uh, having exactly the same uh, area. Uh, I've also chosen things to be four connected. Uh, what that means is that the, the robot uh, can go north, south, east, west, so the, the cardinal directions. Uh, but in this picture, the robot cannot move diagonally. That's just the choice I made. It's sort of arbitrary. Uh, I could have made this eight connected, so you can the robot can move north, south, east, west, but also in the, the other directions, like northeast, northwest, uh, southeast, and, and southwest. Uh, so that's another uh, choice that we need to make. Um, and in your mind, I think it's useful to extend this to, to three dimensions. Uh, and you can see that things start getting a, a bit more complicated if we're uh, doing things in, uh, in 3D. Um, and yeah, we also chose uh, some resolution for the grid. So I just kind of arbitrarily chose the size of the grid. I could have made this coarser. I could have made it finer. Uh, and that's going to have some uh, impact on the uh, amount of computation uh, that it takes to, to solve this uh, planning problem. Uh, so if I make it very fine, uh, then the amount of computation is going to get higher, uh, but we can traverse like very narrow gaps. If I make it very coarse, uh, if you have narrow gaps in your environment, uh, then if you just think about the discretized 
version of the planning problem, uh, you're not going to be able to necessarily find a, a path uh, in that lift to die space. OK, so I mentioned graph search. I guess just a, a reminder for, uh, for what a graph is. Uh, so when we talk about graph uh, in the context of motion planning, uh, what I mean is a collection of vertices, uh, also known as, as nodes, uh, that are connected with edges. Um, and at least for now, we're going to think about undirected graphs, so no arrows. Uh, so essentially, the edges define connectivity. Um, so your robot can kind of go from this vertex to this vertex, or this vertex to this vertex, uh, but cannot jump between two vertices that are not connected by, uh, by edge. So I guess that's what I mean by graph in, in this context. Um, so we're going to think about uh, the motion planning problem uh, for discretized environments as a graph search problem. Uh, and the way we're going to do this is by associating a vertex uh, for our graph uh, with each cell in the grid. So each of these empty spaces uh, is going to correspond to a, a vertex in a graph. Um, so there's sometimes a point of confusion which occurs, which is to think about vertices as like the, the kind of corners, like where, where uh, the lines meet. Uh, so those are not what I'm going to call vertices. Uh, each cell here. Uh, like each kind of empty space is going to be uh, corresponding to a vertex. I'll illustrate that uh, just to make it more clear in a couple of slides. Um, we're going to connect vertices with, with edges uh, either based on like four connectivity or eight connectivity, uh, as I mentioned before. Um, and then we're going to delete any vertices uh, and corresponding edges that have an obstacle. So we're just going to lay down a uniform grid, uh, associate vertices with each cell in the grid, uh, connect them using four or eight connectivity, and then basically take out vertices and corresponding edges uh, when there are obstacles. I'll, I'll go through that process in, in more detail for one uh, specific example. Okay, so I guess here, here is the example, uh, and just a couple of references as well. Um, so Planning Algorithms, which is a textbook by uh, Steve Laval, uh, is a really amazing reference for all things uh, related to motion planning. Uh, I think the textbook was written around 2006, uh, but it's uh, yeah, it's still like pretty uh, up to date uh, and has yeah, it's, it's really really good. Uh, and I've written down some specific uh, chapter references in case you're interested in digging more into some of the details here. Okay, so here's a uh, an example. Uh, so in this case, we have one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. So like a five by five uh, grid um, that that we've uh, discretized our uh, continuous environment into. Uh, again, the goal is to get from uh, point A to point B. Uh, without colliding with this blue uh, obstacle region. Uh, and I've just written out the, the process that I, I sketched on the, the previous uh, couple of slides to associate a, a vertex with each cell, uh, connect the, the vertices using some uh, convention like four or, or eight connectivity, and then remove vertices and edges uh, that are occupied by obstacles. So let me just go through that process uh, kind of explicitly. Um, so here is the, the first step. Uh, so each cell is being associated with a vertex. Uh, for simplicity, I'm just going to choose four connectivity. Uh, so your robot can go uh, north, south, east, west, uh, except at the, the boundaries. Um, uh, the next step then is to remove the, the vertices uh, that have some obstacle. Uh, so anything that was kind of in the, the blue region, we take those vertices out. Any edges uh, that were connected to those vertices that we took out, uh, we take those edges out as well. So we're then left with this. Uh, graph. Uh, so hopefully that process was clear, but maybe I'll, I'll pause for a second and, and see if there are questions on that. Okay. All right. So we're going to have to use some labeling uh, convention. Um, so I'm going to label uh, vertices with i, j. Uh, so this is x comma y. Uh, so this is column comma row. So not the usual like matrix convention, but with just like x, y. I think it's simpler to uh, to think about that. Uh, so, for instance, uh, the starting configuration A is 2, 3, so the second um, uh, column and the, the third uh, row. Uh, so we're indexing starting from 1, not starting from 0. I think it's easier to, to think about uh, 1 indexing in this, in this context. Uh, and 5, 5, uh, that's the, the goal uh, configuration. Okay, so the, the basic kind of idea behind graph search is to uh, start off uh, at some vertex. So we're going to start off at the, the starting vertex A. Uh, we're going to incrementally explore uh, the graph, uh, kind of expanding out from the, the starting vertex A, um, and then until we've arrived at the, the goal vertex, uh, which is B, and then we're going to stop. 
Uh, and as I mentioned today, uh, we're going to just focus on finding feasible plans, so just some way uh, to get from uh, what XA to what XV without colliding with the obstacles. Uh, we're not going to think explicitly about optimality. We will do that in the, the next lecture. All right. So here's the, the general kind of uh, algorithm I've, I've written, out, written it out explicitly. So I'm not expecting you to parse through this uh, in detail. I'm going to walk through uh, an example, and I think it'll become much uh, clearer. Uh, what I want to highlight is just the structure of the algorithm. Uh, so we're going to maintain one kind of key uh, data structure, uh, which we're going to call Q. Uh, so Q, I guess, is short for the word Q, like Q-U-E-U-E. -U -U -E. Uh, so we're going to add things and, and take things out from, from that uh, queue. Um, there's a while loop. Uh, so the while loop ends uh, essentially when you reach the, the goal uh, configuration. Uh, and there's a for loop here, uh, which is kind of the incremental exploration part. Uh, so we're going to uh, start off with some node, look at its neighbors, uh, look at the neighbors of the neighbors, and, and so on, uh, until we finally reach the, the goal uh, configuration. Okay. So let's walk through this example. So we've already discretized it uh, in, a, uh, in the, the last uh, couple of slides. Um, so the, this Q uh, data structure, uh, we're going to start by initializing it uh, with the starting vertex. So the starting vertex, again, we're, we're calling A, uh, which is the same as, uh, as 2, 3. Uh, we're going to maintain another data structure. That data structure is just a list uh, of all the vertices that we've already visited. Um, so A, uh, we're starting at that vertex, so we're going to mark that as visited. Uh, and all the visited cells, the visited vertices, uh, I'm going to mark in red in the, the picture. OK, so that's the, the zeroth kind of iteration of the algorithm, just the, the initialization. Uh, so the first uh, step of the algorithm, the first iteration of the algorithm, uh, we're going to take something out of the queue. Uh, so there's this queue.get vertex function. Uh, right now, there's only one thing that's in the queue. That's the, the starting vertex A. So we don't have any choice. We're just going to take that out. Uh, and anything we take out, we're going to call that x. So we've taken 2, 3. That's the, the A vertex uh, out of the queue. Uh, we're then going to look at the, the neighbors of x. Um, so there are only a maximum of like four possible neighbors. We're looking at uh, four connectivity. So if you look at the, the 2, 3 uh, vertex, uh, the, the neighbors are 1, 3, so that's this vertex over here, uh, or uh, 2, 2, uh, that's this uh, vertex over here. So I'm just listing uh, the vertices, uh, the, the neighbors uh, of 2, 3. Uh, we're then going to mark these uh, as visited, uh, so I'm shading them or coloring them with, with red, uh, and then add them to the queue. Right, so the, at the end of this first iteration, so we've taken out the A vertex from the queue. Uh, and we've put in uh, two vertices, like the, the neighbors, uh, 1, 3, uh, and 2, 2 into the, the queue. All right, I guess any questions on, on this first iteration of the, the algorithm? Yes? Yeah, so I think you already touched on this, but we're assuming we know like, the location of all the neighbors of, of all the vertices, I guess. Like, yes, exactly. Um, so we are given, so originally we were given the, the obstacle. Uh, geometry. We're given the starting and the, the end locations. Uh, and from that, we can um, sort of derive this uh, graph, uh, which uh, encodes all the, the connections, like any, uh, like all the kind of yeah, uh, jumps that the robot can make in, in one uh, step. Yeah. Question? Can we visit uh, vertices twice? Uh, so I'll, I'll get to that. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I'll, I'll get to that in, in just a second. Um, yeah, I guess the, the short answer is no. We're, we're not going to uh, sort of repeatedly uh, visit vertices that we've already uh, visited. OK, I guess other questions on this first uh, iteration? Question? Just like, at what step are we removing A from the queue? Um, just at the very beginning. Uh, so we're this whole thing. Sorry, say that one more So like we're getting that, the 2, 3, and then we remove it immediately. Uh, yes, in, in the first iteration, we initialize the queue with 2, 3, uh, and then we're, we're just taking that out like immediately. Um, yeah, so I guess it gets more interesting at the, the next iteration. Um, so at the end of the first iteration, this was our queue. So we took out 2, 3, we put in its, words, its neighbors, 1, 3, and, and 2, 2. Uh, we marked those as visited in, in red. 
Uh, and now we're going to take out uh, something again from the, the queue. Um, so here we're going to implement what's known as a, a first in, uh, first out uh, convention for uh, taking things out of the, the queue. Uh, so basically things that were uh, put into the queue first uh, are going to be the ones that we prioritize when we take them out of the queue. Uh, there's some kind of like tie breaking that needs to, to happen. Uh, so when we list uh, neighbors in every iteration of the algorithm, uh, we can choose some particular convention uh, for exactly how the neighbors get added into the queue. Um, it doesn't really matter that much, but for instance, we could go like clockwise or, or anti-clockwise. Uh, I think I've picked some particular convention, but, but maybe I'm not being uh, super uh, careful. Uh, but yeah, just imagine that uh, there's, there's some particular convention like where you start off like with the, the neighbor that's on the, the west, and then you go like clockwise around. Uh, and, and add things in, in that order. Okay, so we're going to take the, the first thing in the queue, uh, so 1, 3, we're going to take that out of the, the queue. Uh, anything we're taking out, we're calling that x. Uh, and then again, we uh, re repeat the same process. Uh, so we look at uh, the neighbors of x, so 1, 3 is this uh, vertex over here. Uh, so it has three neighbors, right? So it has uh, 1, 4, that's this vertex. It has 1, 2, that's this vertex. And it has 2, 3, which was our original kind of starting vertex A. Uh, and I, yeah, I guess this hopefully answers your question about whether we can, uh, whether we're going to revisit uh, vertices. Uh, so if we've already visited uh, a neighbor, so we've already uh, visited A, that was marked in red, uh, we're not going to revisit it. So we won't add that to the, the queue, uh, because in a sense, we've kind of already uh, explored it. Uh, so that's why I've added it, but then I just like, crossed it out. Um, so we mark these as visited again, and then add the, the neighbors to the queue. So just to kind of reiterate here, so I took out 1, 3 from the queue. So 2, 2 is still there. So that's now like first in line in the, the queue. And then we added 1, 4 and 1, 2. Question? Um, so it's kind of like uh, Yes, yeah, yeah. So it's exactly breadth for search. Uh, I guess I'm reintroducing. If you've seen breath research, this is exactly uh, breath research. But uh, yeah, you've probably seen it if you've uh, taken the computer science courses. Uh, if you have a different, different background, I guess you haven't seen it. So I, I did mention that depending on your background, things might be more or less familiar or easy. Uh, so yeah, people with a CS background, uh, this should all be uh, relatively familiar, probably. Good. Other questions? Question. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. People still use uh, graph search. Uh, so you mentioned, I guess, the, the Bellman operation, like dynamic programming. Uh, those mm -hmm. operate uh, in a similar with a similar structure. Uh, they have like more uh, heuristics to guide the search, uh, and I think that, that's something I'll, I'll mention. Uh, in the, the next, we'll actually spend some time uh, thinking about that in the, the next lecture. But uh, yeah, even the, the modern day kind of like search algorithms uh, like use uh, ideas from graph search. So I think it's useful to, to understand the, the graph search basics uh, to get to more like advanced algorithms. Okay. All right. So let's just go through maybe uh, one or two more iterations. So iteration three, uh, this was, I've just copied over the, the queue from the, the last uh, iteration. Uh, again, we're implementing first in, first out. We take out 2, comma 2, uh, which is the, the first thing. Uh, we look at its neighbors. Uh, so 2, comma 2 is this vertex over here. Uh, so again, it has three neighbors. Uh, so 1, comma 2, 2, comma 3, and then 1, comma 2. Uh, two of these neighbors have already been visited. They were the, the ones that are marked in red. Uh, so the only new thing that we need to add is 2, comma 1. We mark that as visited and then add that to the, the end of the, the queue. Uh, and then we repeat. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll go through this one, one last iteration. So this was, again, the, the end of the, the queue from the, the previous iteration. Um, uh, or sorry, the, the queue from the end of the previous iteration. Uh, we take out a vertex, uh, the first one, which we're calling, uh, which is 1, 4, which is this vertex over here. We look at its neighbors. There are just two of them. One of them we've already visited, so we don't uh, pay attention to that. Uh, the new one, 1, 5, we mark that as visited, uh, added to the queue. Uh, and we yeah, keep going 
uh, until we've reached the, uh, the goal vertex. Um, and I guess uh, when I say reach the goal vertex, what I mean is when x, so the thing that we take out from the queue, uh, we can check uh, if it's equal to the goal vertex. Uh, if it is, uh, then, then we stop, we terminate the, the algorithm. Okay, I guess any questions on the algorithm itself? Yeah, and you can maybe look back at the, the fully like, fleshed out algorithm that I've written out on the slides. It's, it's uh, uh, going to be posted on, on Canvas uh, and compare that with the example. But yeah, I guess questions on, on the algorithm. Okay, so one thing I, I didn't, we didn't do is actually find the, the path, right? Like we just have this algorithm that started somewhere, ended when it reached the, the goal. Uh, but I didn't tell you explicitly how to get the, the actual like, path from, uh, from A to B uh, out of this algorithm. Uh, so we have to make a small uh, kind of modification uh, or addition to the, the algorithm, uh, which is that we keep track uh, of parents of vertices. Um, so basically, uh, every vertex that we explore uh, was the neighbor of some vertex that we were calling x. Right? So for every x, we were looking at its neighbors. For every neighbor, we could say, uh, this is the, the vertex uh, that is sort of my parent that I came from. Uh, and we can keep track of that for, uh, for, for every vertex. Uh, and then we can backtrack. So we can look at the, the parent of the goal configuration. And then we can look at the parent of the parent, and then the parent of the parent of the parent, and so on. Uh, and then we're guaranteed to uh, get to A, which is where we started off. OK. Um, I guess questions on, on that? OK, good. All right, so yeah, just a, a few notes. Um, so we implemented this q.getVertex uh, using this first in, first out uh, methodology. So anything that gets put into the queue first uh, has priority uh, when we uh, take things out. Uh, and yeah, as, as someone mentioned, this uh, goes by the name of breadth first search. Uh, and the reason uh, it's called breadth first search is that we're prioritizing uh, breadth rather than, than depth. Uh, so essentially what uh, BFS, breadth first search, is doing is it's searching for all paths of length k uh, before moving on to uh, searching for uh, paths of length uh, k plus 1. And that's kind of the, the structure of the, uh, the algorithm. So it's, we're exploring here, and then we're exploring here, and then exploring like paths of length 2, and then length 3, and, and, and so on. Okay. Um, so I guess there's a, a different, uh, yes, question. How do we store them? Yeah, because we're storing like each vertex in this queue. Yeah. But then how are we storing the parents? Are we just making a parallel queue? Yes, yeah, I think that's, that's the way, uh, or at least that's the simplest way to do it. Uh, there might be more sophisticated sort of data structures, um, but at least for the size of planning problems we're going to deal with here, you won't, worry, you won't have to worry too much about like memory efficiency. Uh, but yeah, the simplest thing is, is just like for every, um, like vertex, just just uh, like you could create like a dictionary or, or a list or, or something. Uh, yeah, nothing more sophisticated than, than that. All right. Okay. So I guess there are other techniques, other uh, like methods we, we could have used uh, to prioritize what we take out from the queue. Uh, so another option uh, is LIFO, so last in, uh, first out. Uh, so this, uh, I guess if you've heard of the, the term, uh, depth first search, uh, that's what this corresponds to. So I'll, I'll go through, uh, I guess relatively quickly maybe, uh, the, the algorithm. So it's just a small modification. Uh, the basic structure of the algorithm is identical to a breadth first search. Uh, the only thing we're going to change is what we take out uh, from the queue at every iteration of the, the algorithm. Uh, so iteration one is identical, uh, right, so we initialize uh, the queue with the starting vertex A, uh, at the first iteration, there is no choice. There's only one thing in the queue. We have to take it out. So we take out X, we look at its neighbors, uh, um, mark those as visited, add them to the queue. Right? So this is identical uh, to uh, the steps we took for, uh, for breadth first search. Um, yeah, so at the end of the first iteration, uh, these are the things that are in the queue, so 2, 2, 1, 3. Um, so there's, again, some specific convention, maybe just think about like clockwise or anti-clockwise, just pick, pick something and stick to it uh, for exactly how you add uh, neighbors in the, the queue. Uh, so here we're taking out 1, 3, which is this vertex. Uh, we're looking at its neighbors, so 2, 3, which we already visited. 
1 comma 4, which is new, uh, and then we add those to the, the queue. So I guess it gets more interesting in, in this iteration, right? So in this iteration, this is the, uh, uh, the queue, so 2 comma 2, 1 comma 2, uh, 1 comma 4. Uh, so 1, 4 is what we added most recently. Um, and so that's the thing that we're going to take out uh, from the, the queue. Uh, so the last thing we added, uh, we're going to take out, we're going to call that x. So x equals 1, 4. So that's this vertex. We look at its neighbors, 1, 3, and 1, 5. Uh, 1, 3 we already visited. 1, 5 is new. We mark that as visited, add it to the, the queue. All right, just one last iteration, maybe. So 1, 5, again, was the, the most recently added thing. Uh, so we take that out when we implement q.getVertex, look at its neighbors, uh, 1, 4, which we already visited, 2, 5, which is new. So we add in 2, 5, and, uh, and so on. All right, I guess questions on, on this version of the algorithm, the, the last and first tag? Go ahead. So in the queue, it's just storing the changes of direction, right? Yes, essentially, yeah, you could think about it that way. So it's, it's, uh, it's uh, storing um, like where to go next. Uh, yeah, yep. It's like what should I? Yeah, what should I explore next? Well, that's that's the way to, to think about the queue. Yeah. Good. Other questions? Go ahead. Um, between DFS and the breadth first search, yeah. which one is more computationally? Yes. Okay. Good. So I was gonna get to that uh, maybe in a slide or so. Uh, okay. I'm gonna skip this. This. Okay. These iterations, I guess, it's kind of just making a beeline uh, towards uh, the goal and, and gets to the, the goal. So yeah, let's, let's think about this question. So I guess what is your I feel intuition? Like the first part is more computation expensive since you're doing so many like searches. Okay. Um, but also, I guess, I guess it kind of also depends because if the depth first, like in the worst case, if it yeah. takes forever to, like, yeah. if it's the last trial to get to yeah. to be, then that would probably be just be just as bad. Yeah. Or even worse. Yeah, so there's no general answer uh, to which one is better. So it really depends on the specific environment uh, that your like, robot is trying to solve the motion planning uh, problem in. Uh, and yeah, the, the intuition is, um, so uh, I guess depth first search is going to keep exploring some particular path like really like deeply uh, until it either gets to the goal or hits some uh, some sort of like dead end, basically, right? Because like, there's nothing else to explore, like nothing uh, unvisited uh, to, to explore. Um, whereas breadth first search, uh, like like I said, uh, explores parts of length k before exploring parts of length uh, k plus one. Um, so it, yeah, if depth first search um, hits a dead end, uh, it's just going to pick some other avenue to explore, and it's going to go like kind of all the way. Until it gets to the goal, or uh, or hits uh, or hits uh, uh, another like that. Um, so yeah, DFS could work well. Uh, essentially, if the path from the starting location to the goal location is really long, uh, and there's only few ways to uh, to get from the uh, the start to the, the goal. So that's kind of the, the intuition I have. So if it's yeah, if it's a long path, but uh, maybe there's only one of like four like long paths that that you could uh, take to the the goal. Uh, then you're gonna like if you just explore all the way to the end, uh, you might find the the path to the goal more quickly uh, than if you were searching uh, all paths of length uh, k before searching all, uh, other like paths of length uh, k plus one. Uh, but yeah, there's there's no uh, like general answer, right? Like like it just depends on the specific environment uh, that you're uh, operating in. I guess, does that make sense, questions on, on that? All right. Um, so yeah, I guess thoughts on like these, these algorithms, breadth for search and, and depth for search, like other ideas on maybe how to improve them? Uh, I think you hinted at it, but uh, uh, all right, go ahead. You can maybe add a heuristic. Yeah. Your only, your first check directions that are like the biggest the step that's like closing your distance to the final target. Almost. Yeah, yeah, so you could guide the, the search. Um, so we're not really exploiting any particular structure of the environment here, right? Like we're just solving this as like a black box, uh, the graph search algorithm. Uh, but the graph has some structure because it's coming from uh, like a discretization of some continuous environment. 
that continuous environment is like a two-dimensional or three-dimensional environment. So there's some like underlying geometry which we've ignored essentially uh, when we're thinking about how to guide the, uh, the exploration of the graph. So um, yeah, so other ways of implementing the, the q.get vertex uh, could involve uh, like biasing, like some heuristics uh, for exploration. So maybe you should explore uh, vertices that are uh, closer in terms of Euclidean distance. Uh, so the distance in the like original like space in which the uh, motion planning uh, problem uh, was, was kind of happening. Uh, so you choose the, the element in the queue uh, that is the, the closest in terms of uh, Euclidean distance, you prioritize uh, that. So that's one uh, sort of reasonable way you could uh, go about biasing the, the search. Uh, there's, there's other like ways as well uh, to to speed up the uh, the search question. I mean, wouldn't that sort of end up being something like reinforcement learning, where you sort of have a, like a reward function that rewarded you the closer you got? Um. So the way I guess I've described it so far, there isn't necessarily any learning. Um. But but you are right. So you could use. We we'll talk about RL. Like, like way kind of towards the, the end of the course here. Yeah, it's good that you're already thinking about RL, but uh, uh, you could use like learning based techniques to come up with a heuristic. Um, so if you've solved, let's say, a whole bunch of different motion planning problems, uh, you could say, okay, like what's, uh, like what are some like strategies for prioritizing what to explore? Uh, and can you like learn that from uh, having solved uh, a whole bunch of different uh, motion planning problems. So it turns out something like that is what uh, AlphaGo and I guess other uh, like similar uh, like Go playing or chess playing like algorithms do. They like because so if you think about like chess or Go, that's a, a really like gigantic search problem. So the initial configuration is the state of the the board, like the, the Go board or the chess board. Uh, the goal configuration is winning, right? Like any configuration uh, that has you win. Uh, so you can think of that as a, a planning problem. So it's a discrete planning problem uh, because the number of actions, number of options you have is just finite. Um, but it's a it's a kind of like gigantic, uh, like discrete like search problem because the number of sequences of actions uh, that can happen uh, grows uh, really really uh, quickly. Uh, so you have to really be clever about. Uh, like choosing your heuristics, like choosing what to explore in the, the graph, uh, and that's where like learning can can come in. Um, but yeah, we'll, I guess, I, yeah, I won't say too much about learning now, but we'll we'll spend a fair bit of time talking about learning uh, closer to the the end of the course. Yeah, good question. Yeah, other thoughts or, or questions on this? Okay, so yeah, we're going to see not the learning part, but at least some way of uh, of biasing the, the search in the the next lecture. Um, another thing that we haven't uh, talked about in, in this lecture is uh, optimality. Um, so again, we just focused on feasibility, like finding some way to, to get from point A to, to point B. Uh, we're going to discuss optimality in the, the next lecture. Um, but in some sense, so even though we didn't directly or explicitly think about optimality uh, when we were thinking about breadth first search or depth first search, uh, it turns out uh, one of those algorithms uh, actually gives you paths that are optimal uh, with some performance criteria. And I guess does someone see which algorithm and, and what performance objective or criterion? Yes? I suppose for the ones that we uh, only just discussed, I guess uh, DFS should, since it always serves to look at paths. Like yep. Yes, yeah, exactly right. So BFS, breadth first search, uh, as I mentioned, searches for all paths of length k uh, before looking at paths of length k plus 1. Um, right, so if uh, your, um, like the optimal, so if, if you think about optimality as being defined by the, the path length, uh, so if your optimal uh, like path, uh, in terms of path length, has length k star, uh, then BFS is going to, explore like k star, like paths of length k star before moving on beyond that. So uh, it's going to give you uh, a path that's optimal in terms of the, uh, the length. Uh, but there might be other performance criteria that you want to optimize, and, and that's not uh, something that we've discussed uh, yet. All right. Yeah, I guess other questions or, or thoughts? Go ahead. 
And this algorithm of crash, I guess it's your corner or something. Because you check off points that's already been at. Do you ever feel like you get stuck in a corner? Yeah, yeah, good question. So uh, does the algorithm crash? So another way to phrase it is, uh, so the technical term is called uh, completeness of the algorithm. Um, so completeness means uh, if there is a path uh, from A to B, uh, then your algorithm is guaranteed to find it. Um, or I guess let me say it a different way. Uh, so an algorithm that has that property, like that uh, it's going to find a, a path if it exists, is called a complete algorithm. Um, and if, if there is no path, then the algorithm will terminate in a finite amount of iterations, like finite amount of computation time, uh, and tell you there's, there's no path. Uh, it turns out these algorithms, so BFS and BFS, are complete uh, for the discretized problem. Uh, so there's a question about how to translate the solution for the discrete motion planning problem to the continuous one. Uh, and that's something we haven't touched upon yet. So it's not necessarily complete for the continuous version of the planning problem. Uh, and the reason, I guess the, the kind of simple intuition is if you chose two cores of a discretization uh, and your uh, like environment has a small gap that you need to get through to get to the goal, then a course discretization is not going to give you a feasible path. Uh, but at least for the discretized version of the problem, uh, these algorithms are complete. So if there is a path, they're going to find it for you. Uh, I didn't prove this. Uh, if you are interested in the proof, I think it's not super complicated, actually. But it's in the, the planning algorithms uh, book in one of the chapters that I referenced. Yeah, good question. All right, yeah, other questions? Cool, I think that's pretty much all I had today. So we'll end slightly early, and I'll see you uh, next week.